doing? What you doing, huh? Okay guys, we're back. This one's gonna be installment number three on the 1988 Showwater Flats Boat series. Um, I had mentioned in the previous two videos about the shallow running boats. Uh, what I basically was talking about was about scooters in the second one. I didn't really talk about any uh, boats that have sidewalls, or like what this one has. I was saving that one for this installment. And like I said, you know, originally Dargo started out as a scooter boat and it evolved into making lines of wall boats and now they got like I guess catamarans that can do basically give you the best of both worlds where you can fish the flats and you can go offshore and fish and that'd be in their cat series but they still make their cat they still make their their scout lines they still make their scooter lines which are their bread and butter lines for the hardcore flats fishermen and shallow sport did add walls because you can get pretty much the majority of them nowadays on any style of shallow sport is going to have that but they took it one step further i think shallow sport makes a tri haul now i guess in that x3 series that they have that's their their big uh, flagship one now that gives you the best of both worlds where you can fish the flats and you can go offshore and fish offshore but it has uh, three pontoons on it instead of the regular cats that have two so um, But that's a very expensive boat too. It's a very high-end boat And I'm sure they run anywhere between 80 and over a hundred thousand dollars easy depending upon how you load it out I think I've even seen some that were 140 150 thousand on those But very a very nice boat though, but it's too much out of my price range uh, I just can't see, I mean, like I say, you know, fishing is a matter of preference. I can't see spending that kind of money on a boat to go out fishing in. I mean, if you have the disposable income, then I guess, sure, why not? I mean, you might as well use it before the government takes it all, you know, spend it on something. But for me, it's just not in my budget to spend that kind of money on a boat. So that's another reason why when I was looking at getting out of the Dargo and upgrading to something else to a little bit bigger platform that was also on my mind was thinking okay um, I want a bigger platform but I don't want to break the bank I don't want to be, get locked into you know a 10 year note an 8 year note I mean back in the day they were almost like cars you could pay them off in anywhere between 3 and 5 years but from what I've been checking now, I think I think they're like 10, 15 year notes or something they do on them now to pay on them. So, so that was also on my mind was I didn't want to get locked into that because, you know, at my age, I'm 56 and I want to enjoy fishing. I don't want to have to be worried about going out having to make the money to, to pay for that boat, you know, to where I want to get the money to, for that. I'd rather just go out and enjoy it. And... And so that made a that played a, a major role too into into what was already in the back of my mind about the boat that I had ridden on back in the 80s. That hey, I'm going to look for something that's old uh, and make sure it's restored, and uh, you know, and just go through it, make sure everything's functional and all that, and that it's good to go. And that's what I'm going to uh, take out to the flats and and fish in it. So. What I wanted to talk about were, I left out a few boats. There's a lot of boats out there. I mean, when you talk about boat makers, when you start looking at it, whether it's for the flats, whether it's for the bay, whether it's for offshore, I mean, there are thousands upon thousands of different boat makers. You, you know, just in, even in the yacht range, the, uh, the sailboats, I mean, it's, it's just crazy that, that manufacturers, how many manufacturers that are out there that make boats for people to buy to try to capture a sale in that market because that market is so big I mean the billions upon billions of dollars that people spend for outdoor recreation it's just phenomenal uh, around the world not just here in the United States but around the world 
So it's a very competitive business. And uh, so there's always a lot to choose from. But I'm talking about down here in the lower Laguna Madre. You know the Florida groups, they've been coming over, you know, with the with the Lou's, which is, a, that's a good skiff. Lou's, by far, I mean, it's been a Florida skiff out there forever. And they have three or four lines. I don't even think they make the Redfish line. To me, their Redfish line was one of the best skiffs that they ever put out. And I don't even think they make that one anymore. I think it's I think I think they make the bone fisher now is the one that they push a lot on over there which is still a pretty good boat but it just seemed like to me that that redfish line that they uh, that they had built in that top, in that style of skiff because I do see a few people out there that are really um, you know eclectic and dedicated to pulling in the flats and, and sneaking up stalking and uh, side of cast you know while they're pull, pulling so I, I do see them out there there are there are those those people that uh, that get into it not as much down here but but there are a few I, I see them on the water and just my hats off to them much respect uh, I wouldn't mind getting a skip one of these days and trying that out this boat here is too big to, to pull I mean when you're talking as wide as it is and as long as it is and as heavy as it is you'd kill yourself out there trying to pull this boat in the flats Trolling motor works perfect. I don't have to worry about pulling. Um, when you when you want to pull around out there, your boat shouldn't be more than four to five hundred pounds max. Six is getting on the heavy side. Uh, like I say, the lighter you are, the better off you are in the in the skinny water. And most of those skiffs, dry weight, they come in around four to five hundred pounds. And that's why they're lightly geared, because when you're pulling it, you don't want to wear yourself out. Um, and I've seen them; they perform uh, relatively well. Um, you're going to get wet in it at the end of the day, more wet than you'd get in this boat, especially if there's a heavy chop. But that's just a trade-off that you get because you want that style of fishing. You know, I see some people out there that fly fish off of the skiffs. You know, um, and fly fishing is starting to pick up down here. But you never know, I may get into that. Um, I may try that out one of these days. I used to fly, my dad used to have a fly, uh, fly rod hung in the garage forever, but I never saw him fly fish. I mean, it, uh, you know, it was, I forget the brand, I, I think it's a Fluger. I think it was a Fluger. But it was an automatic one. You just press the button and it automatically rewound, and then you get the release to, to start flicking it out there. But I never, I never saw him use it. He had little flies and all that stuff and a little round thing that clipped on his belt. And whenever we go fishing, he'd always break that out and take it with us. But never used it. <laughs> always, always used a regular uh, uh, spinner pole, you know, and. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, that might be something I might get into and do some videos on that, too. Because I wouldn't mind doing that, especially early in the morning. Because uh, you can see them, because the Reds love that top water early in the morning. But this time of year, they'll, they'll hit top water pretty much all day long. But early in the morning, when you see all that bait moving around them and stuff, and you can see those game fish in between there, yeah, the, I can see how flies work really well out there. And uh, when it's a nice, dead, smooth glass, dead calm out there, the water's like glass. But, uh, but like I say, there's a lot of boats. But the big ones, I was just talking about the big ones that were here. And uh, somebody in the comments mentioned about uh, a couple other ones, uh, which I'd already had anticipating making this video because I was gonna talk about those because those are more, uh, uh, how should I say, fall in the category with what this boat is. Uh, back in 1982, John Mayak up in Corpus Christi opened up his boat company, Mayak Boat Works. And him and his group were always looking for a better boat that performed better in the shallow running water that could really get in the skinny. And they really knocked it out of the park with that RFL series that they made, the Redline series, Redfish series. Uh, and that is a phenomenal boat too. 
it'll get just as in, as much skinny water as this boat. It's a big boat, and it will draft just as shallow and get up in just as shallow water as this as this shoal water will. Uh, and the same thing, the trade-off with that boat too, just like it is with this boat, is that um, it's not a smooth riding boat. It's perfect for the flats. Probably one of the best boats out there for the flats like this is, like it was made in the, in the 80s. Because like I said, the those Dardo scooters were really good for the flats. The sh Shallow Sport, the Fantail, one of the best boats ever made to get out there in that skinny water for the flats. Uh, this Shoal Water, one of the best boats ever made to get you into the skinny water. And then I would put that Mayak, the RFL line, in that in that St. Metch line. Uh, very shallow draft, very shallow running, very good boat. But all those boats that I just named off are not, uh, they don't cut the water well. So when you get in the chop, you know, you're, you're going to feel it. They're, they're rough riding boats. And that's just a downside to if you're going to get a flats boat. That's why you have some people turn over to skiffs because they're narrower and they have a nice V cut in the bow. So they'll cut that water nice, but the skiffs are narrower. They're, they're, I mean, you're talking, I don't know, five feet, five and a half feet wide. They're not real wide. So they're not as stable. So you're gonna have a lot of this in the water when you're out there because the, the smaller the width, the less stabilization you have in the water. The wider the width, the more stabilization the boat's gonna be. It's not gonna roll back and forth as much. You know, rock, rock you back and forth. But like I say, it's a trade-off. Whatever you want to do, you have to keep that in mind. You have to give up something to get something. And those skiffs can, can get in pretty shallow water. And, and I, th I think most of those don't even have a tunnel on them, on those skiffs that they put out. I mean, Hughes puts out a pretty good skiff. Hell's Bay puts out a pretty good skiff. Maverick puts out a pretty good skiff. Uh, East Cape skiffs does a really good skiff. All those skiffs that I'm naming, those are all Florida groups. And you see a few of them here and there down here. You don't see them as much, but if you go up around probably Port Lavaca, Corpus Christi and stuff, you'll probably see more of the, the skiffs operating. Um, but there is a few people out there that, that, that ride in those, because I see them at the dock, pulling in, pulling out. And usually it's people that are guides and they're taking people out to go uh, pole in the flats. And, that, and that's a beautiful art. I mean, I love the flats. Uh, what, I, what I consider what I do is, uh, is just for me, and, uh, and what I see how what they do, they provide a service to give somebody an experience on something that they would never be able to do. You know what I mean? Uh, so yeah, I mean, I have uh, you know much respect. Because you have to read the water, just like what I'm looking for. You have to sneak up real quiet. You got to get up in the back, and you got to slowly pull it in there. And you have to look, see the drop off, see the potholes, see the shadows moving, see the bait moving, and then you have to take your best shot. Like, hey, you need to throw here. This is where they're at. So that's very detailed, very personal. I do similar to that, but I just don't pull. I, I, I use the trolling motor if there's no wind. I like the wind blowing me. I like I like long straight drifts is what I like. If I have I don't like a lot of wind. I just need enough wind to move me along, so I can give me time to work the area all the way around the boat. I usually like going 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. That's usually how I work it when I'm casting. Um, you know, so, um, but let's get back to the boats. So, uh, when we're talking boats that have sides on them, uh, back in the 80s, Mayak was one that was really coming on and it really got a name in the 90s. And now I think, I don't, I want to say they still make a flat bottom boat. I know they're into making catamarans, just like uh, Show Water is into making catamarans and just like Dargo is into making catamarans. But I'm sure they probably have a line there somewhere still that you can still get something similar to what they made in the 80s but if you could ever score one of those ones that were made in the 80s and the early 90s definitely a good boat that would be to 
restore and be an excellent flats boat because it can get really sh it can get in the skinny just like the shoal water can because I know they only made so many of them and a lot of them you know went to the scrap yards <laughs> you know um, but that uh, Mayak John Mayak definitely a uh, a contender in, in shallow water running just right up there with shallow sport just right up there with show water just right up there with Dargo um, and then then you have also you have the, the flats cat that it's more of a scooter style they may make one I think with the walls on it but they were they were originally also a scooter style and they make a pretty good boat too. get you in the shallow shallow stalker is another one that you see out there that's been around for a while um, they, they're similar to me I consider shallow stalker and I consider uh, shallow sport pretty much the same boat the hull design is just almost identical you know um, from what I see I've never owned one but just my observation is the way it moves in the water the way uh, it gets up in the water and it they, they, they pretty much look the same on the old uh, classic style you know the new ones are probably catamarans too because that's what everybody likes everybody's going to that catamarans I don't know who all makes the tri hauls I haven't done enough research on that because I don't really keep up with it but I do know that X3 series that Shallow Sport puts out is is a is a tri haul and um, I guess for more stabilization because the catamaran only has two pontoons in it and this one has a third so I guess it gives you more stabilization it's not going to rock as much when you're in the water when you put that extra one in the center but like I say it's a high-end boat I probably won't ever own anything <laughs> something like that um, and I mean I wouldn't catch any more fish out of a boat like that if I did buy one and decide to go splurge and spend the money to get something like that I wouldn't catch any more fish out of that uh, $100,000 boat than I would out of my $16,000 boat. So, so uh, I'm a practical guy. Um, I'd rather spend the money on something else. As long as this suits my needs, and like I say, everybody has different needs, and this just suits my needs. This works perfect for what I do out there in the flats. And somebody may do something different, and they may need a boat like that, and if they got the, the disposable income, then you know, by all means, you know? I mean... That's the whole point of the uh, Lower Laguna Madre is for you to go out there and enjoy yourself. Fishing, yeah, is great, but just spending the day out there, the wildlife, the water, the noises, the sounds, the beauty of the sunrises, the sunsets, the cloud formations, I mean, it's just incredible. We don't know how lucky we are to have that resource right here in our backyard, you know, and, and you can go out there anytime and enjoy it for free. Other than you just gotta have a boat to get out there to enjoy it, but but other than that, it doesn't co it just cost you the gas to put in the boat, fuel to get down there with the truck and to dock it off. Um, incredible. Uh, that's why I make videos when I can. I try I, I try to put them in there so you guys can because I'm just trying to show you guys how beautiful it is out there on the lower Laguna Madre. I mean I. And the best way to do that, I can sit here and talk to you about it, about the experiences, but to show you with the drone footage is just, it's just remarkable, you know, how, you know, because most places are like, it's only this one style of fishing, but here we have, you have, you know, you have channels that you can fish in, you got grass flats, you got sand flats, you got mud flats, you got bays, you have coves you have uh, guts, you have uh, the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, it's just, cra it's, just, it's just crazy in just one little area, you have all these different types of systems and each one of those systems has something a little bit different going on that you can go and fish and you can enjoy that style of fishing. You know, if you want to go to the sand or the drop-offs to catch flounder, they're there. Uh, and which I'll probably do. I, I don't really fish for flounder. I used to a long time ago, back with my dad. My dad was a big flounder guy. He loved flounder. My mom, too. When they were alive, they, that's, 
one thing that they love, they, they love to do flounder. Um, I may, uh, I may go back and do that. Do some flounder fishing. Make a video on flounder fishing. Uh, I, I think the, the season, I think they're, they're back in season now. I want to say either yesterday or the day before was today. The, I think yesterday, yesterday, the season opened again on them. So I don't know. We'll see. Um, I was looking at an old Cameron County map of Aurora City, 1907. And on there, it was pretty interesting. It showed, uh, it showed parts of Cameron County and then along the coast. You can barely make out the Arroyo, but it showed in there where it Y's off that where it shows at the Y how that was a hot spot for flounder fishing on both sides. Usually, you know, it's on the north side is, is where I've always caught flounder. You go, when you head out the Y and right there at the north, you just start working that bank all the way down to Morro Bay and on that drop off and that slope, that's usually where you catch a lot of flounder at. But in that map, it was showing that the south side by on the rattlesnake side side was really big opportunity for flounder. But of course, you know, that's what, a hundred and I don't know what, 20 something years ago when that map was made and I'm sure the fishing was different back then. There were a lot more and I was reading on some of these characters that are considered pillars, you know, especially back when the island was just one island and there wasn't no cut in it and there was no uh, uh, channel that was, you know, dredged for the uh, international or the intercoastal waterway. Um, and these people that were some of the first pioneers, which I'm probably going to do a video on that and uh, to show the first ones that were going out there and it's phenomenal what they were catching. I mean, they'd catch redfish out there. You're talking like one of them had like 900 pounds of redfish and then they'd take them up into Corpus Christi and they would sell them at the fish market. Um, and then the trout, then some of those pitchers, those old black and white pitchers, I mean, all those trout were huge that they were catching. And they were catching these in the surf. These, these, these they were catching off of the, off of the beach out there on the, on the Pottery Island National Seashore before it what became a national sea, seashore. Um, but um, but that, that'll be another video because there was some pretty interesting history there about fishing the Laguna Madre, you know. Um, but anyway, like I say, Mayak, excellent boat, uh, hands down. Uh, another shallow stalker, another one that gets out there in the, in the shallow flats. So like I say, there's, there's a lot of them. Um, but I'm just talking about the basic boats that you see that are used on our area of the lower Laguna Madre. That's the ones that I see a lot out there of. A lot of the other ones, I don't really mention them because you don't really see them. Yeah, you go up to Corpus and Houston, where you're up there at San Luis Pass, uh, Trinity Bay, you'll see all kinds of like, I mean, a lot of different styles of boats that you don't ever see that's down here. Uh, but in this third series, what I want to talk to you about also is on my flats boat, I mentioned about the overheating issue. So I'm gonna cover that in detail. I did find the pictures when I stripped it all down. So I can detail this out and then I'm gonna turn the motor on back here to show you what I look for when I'm looking for a, uh, to make sure that my water pump's performing. I don't look for the little telltale that everybody looks at that shoots out the back of the top of the motor there that shoots a little water stream. I don't pay attention. I could care less if that shoots water or not. That doesn't matter to me. I mean, if it's not shooting water, that doesn't mean that the water pump's not working. I'm gonna show you where I look, and this is where you were, on my motor, where I pay attention to. If I'm not getting a stream in this area of the engine, then I know for sure that I have either a clogged issue, because I learned this, like I said, I learned this part, taking the engine apart, and I traced all these water passages down, and I see where they go and, and where the main thing is. It's all, I'd never noticed that. I don't know if my my Evinrude motor was that way, my old Evinrude 88. I never looked there. I always looked at the telltale. I never looked in this area of the lower end unit to see if it's producing water. And now I know that's where you need to look. If it's not shooting a, a strong jet stream out that area, then you know you have one, a bad impeller, 
or two or there's a clog in your water passages somewhere. So that's what I always look for when I uh, clear it out. After I bring it in from a run, I hook the, put the muffs on it, turn it on, turn the water on and fire it up. So we're gonna, I'm gonna cover that. But before we get to that, let's just cover real quick again. We'll go over, like I told you, when I first, everything's used on this boat. That, that motor is a used motor that's back there, that uh, 115 Mercury that I have, four strokes. It's a 2006 model. Um, what had happened was uh, I'd gone out and yeah, it ran. It ran all right, but then I started having like overheating issues with it when I'd be out for so long, it'd overheat. And, uh, and it, they had told me that they had put a brand new impeller on it and all this and everything went and that it was you know in the motor and all that and that was good to go and that it only had 200 and I think 30 hours I don't remember is it between 220 and 230 that they told me 235 or something that they told me um, I mean that's been like four whatever that is four or five years ago you know because I was still relishing of all the other stuff trying to get everything together might not have been paying attention but I know it was 200 it was under 250 hours that I do know I do know that at that, that they told me that it was under and then when I asked well what do you mean under 250 and then that's they said oh about 220 I don't have one of those computers to hook up to this engine that's supposed to tell you I guess maybe one of these days I'll get one to hook up to it that that'll read it and it'll be able to tell me exactly how many hours but I know it's got a I know it's got a lot of hours I know it's got more than that I know it's got a lot more than that because uh, when it started overheating I was thinking okay I got a blown head gasket because when I took the, the drop the lower unit opened it up looked at the impeller that's when I told you I found the keeper and it had cut into the actual housing I mean made a big cut almost all the way through it you saw it, water was sweet seeping out of that housing and then it had chopped off a lot of the, the fins on the impeller to the blades. So, because they had left the old keeper in there when they had installed the new impeller and put the new keeper in. I don't know how, I guess maybe it fell down on the bottom and they didn't see it when they set the old, the new impeller on top. And then as it started turning, it, it slung out with centrifugal force and then it got, started just chewing everything up in there. So I, I bought a whole nother kit. Like I said, I spent like 250, 260 bucks down at Bass Pro. Bought the entire housing, new seals, uh, the new plate that goes below it. I bought the, it had that gasket in it too. So you pull that plate off that sits below the, the housing with the, with the housing bolts too. Put all that in. And of course a new impeller with a new keeper fit. And uh, anyway, so I buttoned it all back up, put it all back in there put the muffs on it, fired it up. And at that time, I was still thinking, you know, I was looking at the telltale out of the end of the, the engine, so it was shooting water. So I was like, okay, it's good. Um, I hadn't learned my lesson yet where I needed to look to see, to make sure that it's uh, producing the water that you need it to produce so it doesn't overheat on, out there on the water on you. So I'm all excited and, you know, I told Cassie, let's, let's get the poles and let's head out, man. So we did. And we took it out and it ran like I told you for like uh, I think it was like four or five runs or three or four runs it ran fine but then on that fourth or fifth run right back to the same problem overheating and uh, the, uh, the horn was going off the engine was getting hot I'd have to stop let it cool down which I was just fishing anyway and, uh, and then uh, fire it up move a little bit further down you know and then boom it overheat and I'd have to shut it off and we'd do some fishing and let it cool, it cool down. And then eventually, you know, we got back in. Just had to do it. In, 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 uh, one time I went out at night. We went out at night, me and Cassie, and, and it overheated. And I was stuck over in the channel. So all night, I didn't even get to my spot that I wanted to go. I was just stuck there on the side of the channel down there before the mouth. Um, so, uh, but then when I fired it up in the morning, the next morning, no heating problem. <laughs> it ran fine. Uh, but, so I got to where it was overheating a lot. So I brought it back. I did a compression test on it first because I'm thinking, oh man, I've overheated it so much. I've blown the head gasket. And the compression was 
on I think I had the I think that I think they were all 135 I think except for one I had one cylinder that was around 127 28 so you know that much difference and drop I'm not really worried about I mean where you have like a 20% 30% drop or bigger then um, then that's something you need to look into me if it's within 10% of the numbers that you know within a 10% range you know a 10 count number I'm not worried about that on the compression that's to me that, that it's still clicking on all all four cylinders um, but if you have it where there's a 20 points difference 30 points difference or 50 or more then yeah you definitely have a problem you know 20 that cylinder is starting to wear out why one either you have a gouge in the cylinder or the rings are broke and it's not holding compression or you have a blown head gasket and water is getting into the cylinder and then that's easy to check because all you got to do is just fire it up and then and then uh, pop the one of the plugs off the cylinder to see if water's shooting in there. So, um, like I say, I do all my own maintenance. Uh, I took shop years ago when I was in high school, and I worked on cars. I never worked on boats till I got a boat, and it, it's all trial and error for me. Um, so when I work on and I, I work on my own because you know it saves me money and plus I learn something. I learn how to do yeah do something different. So anyway. It was all within tolerance. So, okay, I'm thinking, okay, so it's not the head gasket. So that's when I said that I did the acid drain. I pulled the lower unit off and I got the muriatic acid and I did the acid drain of the block. Um, and then it took a little while, it took about five, 10 minutes and then water started coming out and then I'm like, okay, so it was clogged because there was some kind of clog up in there. And then once it started coming out again, pretty good. I'm like, okay, so it's cleared up buttoned it all back up, put the lower unit back up in there, and uh, we took it out and went out again. And it ran a couple of times, it ran fine, no issues. And then again, on the third try, boom, came back to the same thing, overheating again, overheating. So, I was kind of bummed out, man, because I was for loss, I'm thinking, well, man, what else can it be? Because, you know, it's pretty simplistic. Uh, I don't know how these new motors are. I know there's, you know, this one has got a computer on it, maybe two. I really, I'm really not sure I haven't had any issues with the computer on it. And, um, but my old uh, Evinrude was pretty much mechanical, other than the coil packs and stuff. You had carburetors, just clean them out, you know, put bigger jets in them if you wanted to run richer so that you don't have any issues of it getting clogged. That's what, what I did. The only downside is when you do that is it smokes really bad out the back so it's not really good for the for the environment you know because you do leave a nice big smoke especially when you throttle it up it gives you a big uh, a nice big black smoke out the back of the engine but when you put those bigger jets and those old carburetors you'll never have you'll never burn a cylinder on that you never you yeah it, you'll never scorch a cylinder on that because you're you're putting extra oil in the cylinder and it's always going to be lubricated which you can't do with these new motors. With the EPA regulations, you can't get away with doing that anymore. Um, but they're loud. That's one thing about a two-stroke. That, that motor was loud. Compared to this, this thing's quiet. And this, even those newer motors, you can't even hear them running. Um, you know, um, but the old two-strokes, granted they ran forever, but they were loud, nasty motors, man. Uh, loud, loud, you know. Um, but anyway, so um, like I said, I've always worked on, on my own stuff. So I told you I, I, I was already thinking because the, the, the paint was already starting to fade on the motor and because uh, it was already used anyway. So I figured, heck, I'm gonna pull those panels off. I'm gonna spray paint, them. I'm gonna paint them up, sand them down, scuff them down, I'm gonna paint them up and uh, and when I did that, I noticed that the whole lower rod of the steering arm and pin, because the steering arm up top already had some big rust chunks in it that were already coming off. I mean, in big, gigantic flakes. So the metal was already getting thin there at the top where your steering uh, mechanism hooks up to it to, to turn it. And then, and then that comes back and it hooks to the rod that goes down 
which is your pin, and it goes all the way down through your 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 uh, your backing plate section. And at the bottom is where your bottom, because you have two engine mounts at the top, and you got one engine mount at the bottom that keeps that rod in place with a with a a, a ring that can, that pops that that seal on there to keep the salt water from going up in there. Um, getting too far up in there. I mean, it's, it's sitting in water, but it keeps it from going too far back up in there. But anyway, um, that whole bottom section was completely gone. You'll see in the pictures when I when I add them to this video. I mean, completely gone. And right then and there, I, I knew that they weren't being truthful that that motor didn't have a lot of hours on it because there's no way that that big chunk of steel is going to be solid, just be completely rusted out at the bottom. Um, and you know, with only 200 hours on it, I mean, that just you know, that's just not going to happen. You're talking that motor there has got to have a thousand hours or more, easy, if not more, easy to be able to have that. That I mean, that motor's been, been in the salt water, been running in the salt water for a long, long time, and staying in the salt water, not really being pulled out, you know, uh, for it to, to do that. And then I looked around, and like I told you in the other video, uh, they no longer made it anymore. Because what you find, what what you're finding now, because it may be to a point that I may have to hang another motor on it, because it's getting to the point that I can't get any parts for that motor back there. When I separated everything out, and I was going to put everything back down in in the oil pump that sits in the midsection. It's like a, uh, a flat plate, and it's got some gears in it, and then your shaft goes, rod goes down, the main rod shaft goes down through there, and that turns all those, and it pumps your oil up. Well, it's got a seal where that rod, that metal shaft runs through. I couldn't get a new one. Nobody had that seal. Uh, the motor's too old. They no longer made it. They haven't made it for years. So I just put the old seal, rubber seal, back in there, and then I used the, the red high heat Permatex and I put it around the top and made uh, and then once everything sandwiched back in there that's and it's been running it hasn't been leaking any oil there so um, but I looked high and low I couldn't get that anywhere nobody had that part anymore and then and, and every place I called at the end of the day that's what they told me that that they couldn't believe I was still running a 2006 motor <laughs> <laughs> you know that I needed to upgrade that was always their advice that I needed to get a newer motor But I'm committed to this one. I mean I got it. I paid for it I'm gonna make it work and I'm gonna run it as long as I, I can make it run um, And it's been it's been doing pretty good lately um, So anyway, I couldn't get that So that's what I'm finding uh, Certain parts so I got to look at salvage yards to try to get the part and seals are very tough because they're already installed. You'd have to buy the whole pump, and then that's another conundrum. Okay, is the pump any good? You know, uh, the seal may look good, but if you try to bang it out of there, then it's just going to disrupt that. It's going to uh, mess up the, the perfect uh, circle of the seal, and then it's not going to seal. You know, so uh, so I just improvised. I improvised, put that Permatex in there for my mechanic days, and and let it ride and it's been working it's been on there for about four years and it hasn't leaked so but anyway you know um being a boat working on boats and mechanics on boats and boat engines uh, I can see why these guys charge because I think they charge a hundred dollars an hour labor or a hundred and fifty dollars an hour labor I think that's what I was noticing like to, to do what I did that's what they would charge you and then it's like an eight hour job or something or, or 10 hour or 12 hour I think 12 hour job I think is what they said that it pays out at 150 bucks an hour and when I saw that I was like man you're crazy <laughs> you know I said man I'll do it myself <laughs> but that, I guess that's what they charge because I can see why they charge it because when I went and did it, it wasn't easy. It was not. It was not. It was not easy, man. I mean, but I always hunker down and I and I and I and I and I, and I muddle through it, man. And I and I get it done, man. I mean, that's always the way I've been. You know, I make it happen. Um, but it was not easy. 
I had never done one before. I mean, all I had ever worked on before is changing the oil on the lower unit on my other boat, putting uh, the impeller on it, changing the plugs out, putting new wires on it. I don't even think I ever changed the coil packs out on that boat. I think those coil packs always ran for the whole entire life that I had that boat for 20 years. Um, other than that, I don't think I did anything else to that boat. Uh, changed the uh, the propellers out. I had two propellers after. So this just goes to show you the kind of person that I am. Um, I told you in the other video about how I borrowed a friend of mine's boat from his dad and we went out and the, the propellers shot off. And that was something I would never have thought to check on to see if the cotter pin was in, you would think that it's in there. But I guess he never used a marine uh, cotter pin and he was using one off of a car for a car. So that metal is softer. It's not stainless steel like the marine one would be. So it's so I guess the RPMs that it's turning, I guess it just that thing straightened out and it slung it out and then the of course from the vibration the, the nut eventually backed out and the whole prop just slung right off out there <laughs> you know out there out there by the jetties out there somewhere in that channel man out there and uh, east of Port Mansfield um, but um, and he kind of blamed it on me that I that I basically I was a dumbass that I should have checked that before I even put the boat in the water which I would never even thought about that but I bought him another prop and it settled the deal and all that stuff once I got him another prop. But that prop wasn't cheap, man. It was like 300 bucks, man. It wasn't cheap you know, to get. It cost a lot. But uh, anyway, so after that happened, when I got my Dargo, guess what I carried in the boat? I carried an extra prop. Rust bearing, nut, cotter pins, so that if that ever happened on, on that Dargo, I always had an extra one in the bow, and I got an extra prop for this one. I got it back there. I just don't have the, the setup. Um, I need to find the nut, because it doesn't use a cotter pin. It uses a, a, a flat washer that, that hooks around. I just need, and I'm having trouble finding it because the boat's so old. So uh, I've been told that it's the same between 115 to 150 that they use the same setup on that lower end. I don't know for sure, but that's what I've been told. But I need to look into it and I need to get it because I got another prop that I'll have in here just in case if that ever happened to this boat, I'll be able to just put the prop on it and let's go. And won't be stranded out there on the water like I was so many years ago in that old uh, 1972 uh, Invader. Um, but it just, always trying to think of things that will go wrong when you're out there and have a plan set in place so that you're not stranded out there that's why I've been very successful like I said I've only been broke down twice on the water and both times I put in in Port Mansfield and I think that's the reason why because I just think I just think for some reason I got I got uh, there's a uh, uh, bad juju over there for me when I put in at Port Mansfield. I have no issues when I put, when I put in at, uh, at uh, Roy City or I put in down there at the island. And like I say, back in the day, I always put, Roy City is my favorite place of putting in, taking out. Back in the day, Sanchez Bait Stand, long before there was a uh, Tome Park, Sanchez was the place on the water. That's where we used to always put in and go out, man. That was the place. I mean, he, it's been long gone. I think they closed in 2016, I think. But, uh, oh, Aaron Sanchez and his brother Pete, those guys, man, they were solid. Never charged for the parking. Uh, they had everything there. They had bait, they had tackle, they had last minute stuff that you want to buy for the munchies for the boat. Uh, you know, oh, Jerry at the bait shop has built a pretty good operation there. I mean, pretty solid. Uh, the only ones that really outdid him back in the day were Sanchez because they had a boat ramp and they didn't charge you for the boat ramp. It was free. You could put in and out there. I mean, the boat ramp wasn't the greatest in the world. Hell, I think even at one time he had his own shrimping boat, so he'd go out and catch the shrimp too. He didn't have to pay a third party to bring it to him or drive off, you know, up north to Corpus Christi to go buy some shrimp and bring it back. They had their own shrimping boat too. Um, so at one time they were a pretty good operation until they started, uh, you know, until it started running down and 
and eventually, I guess when they passed away, they, everything just kind of, uh, I guess it was too much for the kids and they closed up shop there. And I wish I had pictures. I was looking for those because I would love to uh, to do a video on nothing but Sanchez's bait stand because that was the place back in the day. And then the one before Sanchez was Wren's, which is in the original part of Roy City. The Roy City that you know today isn't the original part. The original Arroyo City is further back. As you know, when you come up to where Chili Willie's is and you hang that left uh, head back, well, you, you go straight. And the original Arroyo City is there on that curve. That's where Arroyo City originally was started back in 1856 or whatever it is, 1866. That's how long it's been there. And it used to be Wren's Bait Stand used to be back there in the 80s. This is the early 80s, 80s, uh, 85. I never, I never talked about Ted McMillan and Danny Stevens. Uh, I used to work for Danny Stevens Custom Service Center. And him and one of the mechanics, which was Ted McMillan, they had a Pinyan that they had bought. They went in partners, a Pinyan offshore rig. And I used to go out with those guys. I used to get seasick when I'd go out. But we used to, we used to go up the coast there. They used to hunt the, like the spoil banks and stuff. Back when, I guess you could, I don't know if you can do that anymore. I know back in the day, you used to be able to hunt those spoil banks. Not on the west side, because the west side is all, when you go up into the land cut, the west side is all rancher property. That's all owned by the ranches. But the east side, where the banks are, there, there's a lot of brush and stuff, and there were a lot of deer uh, that used to run all up in there, all kinds of stuff. I mean, even hogs, you name it. it. It was, you know, back in the day, and they used to like going up there hunting that, and then they'd go out, shoot out, because he lived in Arroyo City, he had a house in Arroyo City, so he, he had his own dock and his boat was there. And I'd go out with them and we'd go out through Port Mansfield and we'd go 17 miles out to the old uh, uh, oil derricks that are out there and, you know, be fishing. He liked to spearfish. So Ted would jump off the boat and uh, go spearfishing and then, of course, Danny liked fishing. And me, I'd, half the time I'd be throwing my guts up, out, you know, off the side of the boat. I'd be <laughs> seasick. That was my first experience of going offshore back in the 80s. But I used to go with those guys. And uh, I never, I didn't mention that uh, in the other videos, but, uh, but yeah, that's where my offshore experiences started coming into play when I started fishing offshore and learning offshore fishing. Uh, those guys had, had an offshore pinyon. I think it was a 22 foot pinyon or something it was. Uh, had the Chrysler motors in the back, I think dual motors, I want to say, in the back of that bad boy. Uh, if I remember right, there were Chrysler motors. I don't remember what size they were. But since they were mechanics, they, 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 they had no issues fixing them. They bought the boat used, they fixed it, it ran operationally really nice. Um, I think they were going to do some kind of charter service, but I don't think that ever took off for them. So they just used it for their personal use. And I used to ride with those guys. Um, very, very, very good, very good guys. Um, but uh, anyway, so I learned some. I learned, started learning a little bit about boat mechanics. So like I said, I worked at Custom Service Center. They worked on boats there too, which were their own boats. They didn't really work on boats for customers, but they worked on their own stuff. And so that's where I started learning, you know, a little bit about boats here and this and that and all that kind of thing. So it kind of carried over once I got my own boat. I could basically work on it. Um, main thing is just maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. So anyway, you always want to make sure you you, uh, you have a plan for, for something. Uh, like if something's going to happen. Like, like that, that tube that fell off on the gas tank here. That was something I could never foresee that would happen. I never had any issue like that. But now I got an extra one. So if that ever happens again, I can fix it right on the water and boom, I'm ready to go, you know. Or I have extra black holes that I can just run down in the, in, into the tank and just siphon it up straight that way too. Two, I mean, two ways to fix that issue. If it ever happens again, I, I know exactly how to fix it and I won't be stranded out there. So anyway, back to the, to the motor. So as the motor gets older, it gets harder to find parts, new parts and stuff to do... Uh, certain things so that's why you need to take care of it when I found out that that pin was completely rusted out I uh, I started looking around and that's like I said I found it up in Illinois at some salvage yard 
Um, I did the deal, they sent it to me, and so I took it out here, right here into the tree back here, right here to this ash tree right here, and I, and I got a come along, a chain hoist come along, the chain style one, and I stripped it apart, I separated it all out. And that's when I found out in there that uh, all the water canals in it were completely clogged up with oyster shell. I had a complete oyster bed growing all up inside the, the water jackets all over the place in that thing. You know, not the big water jackets, but the small ones that run all in between the uh, power head, the midsection, and the, and the lower end unit. All that was clogged. And so I got my air gun, shot out what can shot out, then I got my pick, pulled them all out, and I went through there and I scraped all the passages with my pick and cleaned it all out and blew it out again and cleaned it all up. Then I buttoned everything back up and uh, fired it up, and it's been running ever since. So before it gets too dark here, I'm going to fire this motor off. Let me get the water hooked up to it, and I'm going to show you what I look for when I want to make sure that my water pump's running. I don't look at the telltale anymore. I found this out. This is how I learned this. Like I said, I'm not a boat mechanic, but I learned this when I took this motor apart. I learned a lot about this motor and how the water system works in it and where you need to be looking for the high pressure to make sure that you're getting the pressure that you need to keep the motor from overheating. So just give me a minute here, and we will be right back because let me get it all set up. I'll be right back. All right, so. So when I put it on, I like to get it up at least here so I'm not struggling down there. I put it this way, the muss, and I run them through here. I guess you can try it on the other side, but for me, it's easier to pull it off this way and you know, once I get it in there, it may be a little bit more difficult to put it in, but when you take it off, it's a lot easier. So these are the muffs. I'll get them in here. And then we just go right down. Oh. So, you just want to make sure you cover it. I'm going to turn the light on so we can see, so you guys can see what we're doing here. So, I'm covering the water pickups on both sides. You see that? Now they're both covered. So I know that's good. And then I'm going to set the engine back down. And actually when I run it with the muffs, I want it level. So I won't go all the way down. You see how I leveled it off? How the engine sits level that's what I'll do and then this is an old engine so I always got to prime this it, it always doesn't stay primed so I come over here and I'm priming it you guys can see this Hold on. I'm doing it with my other hand that'd be easier And it takes a lot to get it primed up because it's been sitting for a while. All right, so. So let me go turn the water on. You guys wait right here and I'll be right back. I won't go anywhere. So you can see my water's on. Alright. I'm gonna fire it up. So you heard the horn beat like it's 
supposed to. Okay, so when I'm looking at this, I don't pay attention to this. I learned this with this motor. I could care if water comes out of there or not. I could care less. What I look for is right there. See that water jetting like a stream? See that? Right in there. A big stream coming down right there. That tells you that your water pump is functioning right. If you don't have water shooting out that hole like that, then you have a, you have a major clog. Either your water pump is no good, or you got a major clog in your watering system. in there so you can see that. You can see how it's shooting like a jet in there? Right past that bolt at the end. On this motor, that's what that's what I look for. I gotta have this jet stream right here where my hand is. I don't want to cover it up. You see that? That tells me my water pump is functioning fine and I got clear passageways in my water jacket system and all the water canals that are in the lower unit that are in the mid section and that are up in the power head this doesn't mean anything to me anymore I learned that once I took this motor apart I learned that that's where you need to look to make sure that you got uh, water pressure coming out if you don't have any water shooting out of that then you have a major issue and you need to take it apart and see what the problem is. Because you're either going to find it in the impeller or you're going to find it that your water jackets are clogged up. And like I said, whoever owned this motor, I don't know the history of this motor, but I do know that it's been ran rough because the collar down here is broken on this. Where the seal is for, well, I'll do it after I turn the water off. So I don't get all wet because shooting water everywhere. But the collar that goes around the prop here is broken there. So they ran over something somewhere, which is probably an oyster bed, more than likely, and and messed it up. And I'm sure that's how all that oyster over a long period of time of always being constantly used and not being flushed out after every use and stuff. I'm sure it. it it piled up in there to where it clogged all the passages and it wouldn't clear and that's where my overheating issue was because like I said it was shooting water this telltale was shooting water and it was still overheating so um, that's why I don't pay attention to that anymore but it wasn't shooting water like that like you see down there when I was having the overheating issues until I clear all that water passage out, then I started shooting, and I'm like, hey, okay. And then I, 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 I traced it down in the schematics, and that's where you should have your water pressure. That's where you need to pay attention. That has to have a jet stream. I don't know if it's like that on any of the other motors, but I know on this Mercury, this series of Mercury, that's how it has to be. That's how you know if you're getting good pressure or not. Water pressure. Without having to put a gauge on it and all that stuff. All you got to do is look there, and if it's not shooting like a jet, shooting out at that little hole right there next to the lower unit, then you have an issue. But as you can see, it fired right up. It runs fine. And like I say, I have no idea what uh, how many hours are on this motor. I don't have a, a computer diagnostic system to hook it up to to tell me which I guess maybe I probably need to buy one eventually but I mean I don't know we'll see I mean if it runs it runs the basic mechanics I can figure out if I ever start having issues with electronics because I do need to take the B I think it's the BCT or the BST on these old uh, uh, four strokes they're behind the manifold 
So I replaced all the filters. It's got three filters. It's got the main screw on here. Actually, it might have four. Three or four. It's got the main screw on here, and then it has a separator one that's here, and then I think it has an end line, and then it has another. So it has four filters on it, gas filters, fuel filters. And it has another one that's inside the VST or VCT, which is basically a car. To me, it's like a carburetor because this is fuel injection, but that's where all the water gets pulled into. It's got a float in there, and then it gets shoot into the injection into the cylinders. But supposedly it has one in there, and I've never changed it, and I think it needs to get changed on this boat. I don't think it's ever been changed on this motor. But I got to pull the manifold off and the uh, the injector rail's got to come off. The fuel rail has to come off because it's mounted in behind there. On the newer boats that I've noticed on the engines when I've seen online, they mount outside the manifold so it's easy access to get to it. But on these old four strokes, it was uh, they, they mounted it underneath that so you got to remove all that to get to it so that's going to be a video that I'm going to do when I do get get around to doing it because I've never done one and then I'll show you guys how to do it I mean I'm going to learn in the process of doing it too um, but yeah that's how it should run don't, don't pay attention to me I don't pay attention to that I pay attention to that water that's jetting out right there you see how it's shooting in a stream a big stream coming out right there on top of my capitation plate that's what I look for and it wasn't doing that before when I first bought this boat and this engine and when I first bought this engine and had this engine and I was out there running it I wasn't getting that big stream like that once I cleaned all the jackets out of all the oyster cells that was clogged up in there and it, it worked fine it, it, it shot out like that all right so let me off and then I want to show you guys where they cracked it. I say I'm pretty sure they ran over an oyster bed or something. Let me turn it off. Alright, so let's take a look. So I'll pick it up. I'll show you where that hole is. Where the water should be jetting out. Okay. So right here, behind this bolt, right here, there's a hole where my thumb is. There's a hole that comes out from your water pump. Your water pump is mounted right in here. Right on this, on top of this, this setup right here is where your, where your water pump housing sits. And there's a hole right here, and it should be just shooting a constant jet stream of water, high pressure water out of there. So what I wanted to show you on here, you see how they broke this? This is broken off right here. So they hit something, man. I have no idea what happened. And then look here, let me pull this out of the way. I want to say this collar is cracked or broken. You see how this is broke off right here on this collar? You see that? They hit something with this engine. And more than likely, it was an oyster bed that they ran into to do this kind of damage to it. And like I said, this whole rod that's right here you see this rod that runs up this is your steering arm goes out here and your pin runs all down through here and it locks in right here somewhere right here i think is where it ends and this is where your lower engine mount is it mounts right here this whole complete bottom section right here is was rusted out on my old one and i'll, I'll put that in the video so you guys can see that of all the pictures that i took when i was uh when I redid this and I put this whole new unit in here because you had to take the top unit had to come off the midsection had to come apart and of course the lower section had to come out and all that was here was just a little shell um, a hollow shell that's all that was there 
and to mount it all in there. I mean, it was a pretty interesting uh, process to do. You see, you see this here. This is your this is your steering arm, and then it attaches to the fan. This thing was pretty rusted out on my old one, and as I see right here, I need to spray this. You see how it's getting a little bit of oxidation, not much, but I need to put some corrosion X on this again to keep this from getting the because that other one was just completely rusted out. It was just breaking off in big chunks. I mean, it, it, you know, you'd be driving out there and you hit something hard, hard wave, and that motor jerks it'd break it and then you wouldn't be able to steer to get back in you know so that's crazy but uh but anyway cassie's getting antsy so we're gonna sign it off uh we're gonna leave it with this and i'll add the uh, pictures to it so i can post this video uh, of when we put that steering arm and pin on. And I saved myself $7,000 by doing that. You know, and it only cost, I think I've spent seven, 800 on all the, the parts. And then plus, well, yeah, about 800 bucks, 800, 850 bucks on all the parts. And, uh, And we took it apart. We took it back here to the tree and put it up in the tree, and that's how we could fix it. And what, what was really bad was, you know, COVID had hit, too, by then. COVID had already hit. So this is, you're talking 2020. So it was hard because it took forever to get the parts. So the boat sat back here in the yard, separated for months, because only certain parts were coming. When I first went over, this is what really kind of made me upset with Bass Pro. I went over there, and I told him, look, this is what I need. This is what I got. They pulled out their schematics and, and showed the whole breakdown of the engine. And I told them, look, I need all this from here all the way down. I need all this stuff to get replaced. And so they looked in their catalog. And, yes, this is all available, available, available. The only thing that they didn't have available that they couldn't get me was the steering arm and pin. Uh, that was no longer uh, being made. It was discontinued because the motor was too old. And, of course, that seal, I told you about that oil seal for the oil pump. They couldn't get me that, that seal either. They couldn't get, get that either. That was no longer available either because it wasn't being made anymore either. Um, you'd have to find, that's what they said, you'd just have to find another hole, another oil pump in a junkyard somewhere and mount the whole thing. Um, but the oil pump was good. I just, I just wanted to replace the seal because I took it apart. You know, it was just me being cautious because I didn't want to put it all back together because it was a pain, man, to, to separate all that out. And uh, and then I put it all back together and I fire it up and I got a big, massive oil leak on my hand because, you know, because the oil is coming out of it. Um, that's what I was just trying to avoid. So, but I did, I went the Permatex route and I haven't had an issue out of it. Um, but anyway, um, so th that's what we did. Uh, I bought those parts and, uh, and then, like I said, I paid for them. I had to pay for everything up front with these guys. So I, I gave them the 800, I think it's $850, $860 or whatever I gave them. And, uh, and they were telling me, oh, they'll be in here. You know, they told me a week and then a week went from one week to two weeks, from two weeks to a month. <laughs> and then, and man, it, it made me so upset, I, you know, with these guys and then they tell me, well, there's nothing we can do. I said, well, you guys knew we were in the middle of the pandemic. You told me when I went up there, I asked you, can you get those parts? And you told me, yes. All you had to do is tell me before you took my money that, hey, there's going to be a delay. We can't get this. It's going to take, you know, three months to get this part, two months to get that part, uh, four months to get this part. And... Uh, that's all you had to do is be up front with me, be straight with me, you know, and, and, and they weren't straight with me on that. They just wanted to take my money. And so what I did was this is how I got around that. Yeah, their parts started trickling in slowly. I get a bolt here, a bolt there. So I went on eBay and I bought all the engine mounts again. I paid engine mounts twice. So I have a second set of engine mounts that finally showed up from Bass Pro because it, it took like almost a year before those damn things came in. But I got them off of eBay. 
and I bought a set there on eBay that was used off of a motor that they had and I got uh, the bolts that were used there that were clean because they were used in fresh water so there wasn't any corrosion on them they, you know they, sh they had all the pictures there and all that so I got a whole extra set of bolts a whole extra set of engine mounts in, in my toolbox there in the garage so if I ever need them for this boat because that's what I had to do because the gaskets came in no problem where the issue was was with the motor mounts and the bolts that go to the motor mounts they couldn't get because they were outsourced to I guess China or Taiwan or wherever it was and then during COVID-19 of course you know how all the supply chain is it's backed up and all they had to do is tell me that in the beginning and I would have already went and looked somewhere else to to fulfill that part of the order but they didn't tell me that until I was four months in that there that there was going to even be longer before I could even get them and that's what really I didn't like with those guys um they just had to be up front with me and I would have take I would have bought the gaskets which I knew that they were going to get and I would have went somewhere else and I could have got the engine mounts a lot sooner and I could have got everything put back together a lot sooner instead of it being 5 6 months into this that it sat out here in the backyard until everything came in and I finally got it because as soon as they told me that it was going to be like another 6 months I said you know what uh, I'm out of here man that's when I started looking and I found them I got them on eBay and uh and they were here I got them within 4 days <laughs> I paid for it right there, boom, and in four days they were here. Uh, and they looked brand new. They were used. They weren't, because you know what, on the engine mount, you always want to check for any cracking in the rubber. Because what I really wanted is I wanted polyurethane. You know, not go back with rubber, because rubber is going to rot. You know, I wanted to use polyurethane uh, mounts, but nobody had those. I couldn't get those anywhere. Anywhere I went, they're all rubber. Even with Bass Pro, the ones that came in, they're rubber. Um, but that's how I did it. That's how I got around it. They came in, and I uh, and I and I hooked it up. And then they, when they finally called me, they called me. I don't know whatever it was, like six months after that. So it'd been like a year. I was waiting on those engine rounds. They finally called me that they finally showed up, and uh, and they said, yeah, yeah, you know, for you to. Uh, you know, you need these, right, to get your boat going. I'm like, man, I didn't wait on you guys. I've been on the water fishing for the last six months. I already got them, but I'll come and pick them up so I have an extra set so if I ever need them. Because, you know, I'm always the kind of person to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. So, but I got a whole nother set. I got another three engine mounts that I can mount on there if I have any issues, you know, with the ones that I have there. But anyway, we're going to sign it off. It's already getting dark. Um, I'll put the pictures in there to show you the whole process of what I did. I don't think I videotaped any of it, but I did take a lot of pictures when I separated everything out. And, uh, and we'll see you guys on the next one. Y'all have a good day. Let's go, Cassie. You ready, buddy? Huh? You ready? <laughs>